Today is March 20th, 2012. My name is Greg Tripoli. I'm the Executive Director of the Onondaga Historical Association, and I am here to interview Judge Stuart Hancock in Casanova, New York, at his office. If they're pointing to the east, so we have to... Oh. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. Well, you've got one pointing pointing north, and you've got one pointing south, so they're, they've uh, taken a pass on Yeah, I, I, I have a small back. collection because my, my, from my travels uh, <clears throat> in the Far East, so there was always elephants that, you know, some sort of elephant. I always yeah. wanted to collect something from my travels, so oh, very good. I, so I ended up getting a bunch of elephants. Do you have little ones, big ones? I, I have little ones and big ones and brass ones and silver ones and inlaid ones and... Good. Yeah. Paper well, mache the whole nine. Where years. were you well, mostly in the Far East? Well, I I I, I uh, <clears throat> traveled a lot in uh, China, um, Japan, throughout Thailand and Burma. Well, it's not Burma anymore. It was Burma when I used to go there. And this uh, was doing what? Uh, mostly vacation. So, I see. Okay. Some work in in China and Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. But uh, but Thailand and Burma and Laos, those areas. Uh, uh, was okay. all holiday and Japan too. I see. Japan was work. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep. Well, I've got a, a quick little story. When you get to it, I'll, about Sasebo, Japan. Okay. And uh, good. <coughs> We're good then. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Judge, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, how you happened to become a lawyer. Well. Uh, I decided to become a lawyer, began to think about it seriously when uh, I was in the Navy uh, after graduating from the Naval Academy and uh, I began to, to think about possibly not pursuing a naval career but going ahead and getting out of the Navy that the war had ended, everybody was getting out, they were downsizing the Navy. and. So I decided to uh, get out of the Navy and uh, went to Cornell Law School. And uh, upon my graduation from Cornell Law School, the, the uh, Korean War had started. So I went back in the Navy uh, and was assigned to the USS St. Paul. <coughs> and uh, I had graduated and uh, passed the bar, so now I was a lawyer, but back in the Navy as a line officer. And uh, I was going to tell you about my first trial, which took place in Sasebo, Japan. And I don't know whether you want me to briefly tell you what that was about. Yes, I'd love to hear. <clears throat> well, the St. Paul came in to Sasebo for a few days, and we received a all ships message to send somebody ashore who uh, had some legal experience to defend two sailors who were accused of murdering a rickshaw driver. And uh, <clears throat> so um, I was dispatched ashore to take on this responsibility, a murder case. I never tried a, <laughs> any case at all. And now I have the responsibility of defending these two sailors in a murder case. And uh, so I'm not going to go into the detail of it. It's very interesting. I have a story which I've written called The Sasebo Story, and I'll give you a copy of it. You can put it in the file. And uh, But to make a long story short, um, I was successful in getting them off on the murder charge, and uh, they were convicted of manslaughter first degree. Um, there's no question that they had been in an altercation with the, with the rickshaw driver. The clues were very, very interesting. The, the story of, about the proof is fascinating, and, and um, what was most interesting mix of it was uh, the Japanese witnesses 
uh, and uh, the, my total inability to cross-examine because we had a, an interpreter who was Japanese. I think they, they got the interpreter from Sasebo. And so I'd ask a question on uh, cross-examination, let's say a simple question like, well, what did he say? And then there would be a conversation in Japanese between the interpreter and the witness, which might go on for three or four minutes. And finally, the interpreter would turn to the court and to me and say, uh, he really didn't say anything. And that would be his answer. And so it was a very interesting experience. And Naturally, I was elated that I could get these two boys off the murder charge because that would have been extremely serious had they been convicted. So anyway, enough of that. I'll give you a, a copy of it. You can put it in the file and read it if you, if, at your leisure. Nothing in particular in your uh, earlier years prior to the Navy or while you were there that actually... Uh, uh, heightened your interest in career in law? No. Uh, actually, I just sort of, you know, I, my father, of course, was a lawyer. And so I just sort of gradually uh, aimed that way. And as, as, of course, it turned out to be exactly the right thing for me to do because um, I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't really know what my interests were or my uh, abilities were. And I think it's so true for so many people. You, you develop a lot <laughs> during, your, during your career. And you, you develop different interests, different abilities. You have different experiences. And finally, you, you focus on what seems to be best for you and the uh, career in which you can maybe make the, the greatest contribution and uh, the career in which you can be good and hopefully do some good. So that's been the case with me. But I, I wasn't at all sure that that's the way it was going to be. And you know, it's strange. Uh, I know this is one of the questions you're going to ask <clears throat> perhaps later, but when you're in law school, you really don't know <clears throat> what direction your, your uh, legal career is going to take. And when I was at Cornell Law School, I thought that I was going to have a career in uh, trusts and estates and things of that kind, writing wills. And I had written an um, uh, article for the Cornell Law Quarterly on um, estates, powers, and trust law, uh, section 922. Fascinating topic, but don't ask me about it. <laughs> No, actually, it had to do with a very, very abstruse, difficult concept called uh, the rule against perpetuities and uh, uh, remote vesting and that sort of thing. And so I actually thought that I was going to get into this sort of technical sort of trusts and estates business. And in over 60 years as a lawyer, do you know how many wills I have written? How many? One. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was, I think, in about during my first year of law practice, and I haven't done anything. Uh, when I got out of the Navy after the Korean War and started trying lawsuits in uh, municipal court then, it's called city court in Syracuse now, <clears throat> and then I branched out from trying lawsuits in city court, to trying major lawsuits in Supreme Court, damage cases, but also uh, non-jury, non technical, business kind of cases. <clears throat> and uh, 
So that's been my career. It's been litigation, really, either as a lawyer or uh, as a judge, which is essentially focusing on litigation. That's what the judges do. You're presiding over litigation or you're deciding litigated cases which are on appeal. And so that's been my total, total career. But it's such a tiny, it, well, I don't want to say tiny, it's a small segment of the legal profession, which is vast. And uh, there's so many different aspects of it. Hospital care, Mary and my daughter, uh, whom you know, is uh, uh, an extremely accomplished estate lawyer. That's what I thought I was going to be, but uh, never did. And uh, this is what she does, totally different from the sort of career that I've had. But the career that I've had has been, has been right for me, and uh, I'm still doing it enjoying it. The, um, let's go, go back a bit to the general practice of law. How, uh, <coughs> what was that like when you first uh, were admitted? Well, when I, when I first started um, practicing law, uh, as I said, and trying small cases in, in uh, municipal court in Syracuse, <coughs> The, the lawyers were much more collegial. It was a smaller group. You trusted each other. A uh, handshake, if you settled a case, you did it with a handshake, and uh, no one ever questioned it. You, and uh, if um, anyone uh, didn't play fair or didn't uh, honor the handshake or something like that, the word got around. <clears throat> and, and so everybody, the lawyers trusted each other. They were collegial. Uh, in those days, <clears throat> the uh, picnics, the, uh, the out at the uh, Hinterwaddles, Hinterwaddles Grove, uh, were entirely different than they are now. We had skits and uh, we had uh, games and skits and, and uh, lots of, well, I remember Bill Fitzpatrick from uh, Banshan King always uh, put on a, a pillow on top of his head, sort of pretending he was the chancellor of, of uh, Syracuse University. And he would, so he was the chancellor and he would make awards, funny awards to lawyers who had distinguished themselves one way or another during the past year. For example, I remember one award to Paul Shanahan. It was a great trial lawyer, but also like from time to time to uh, imbibe a little bit. And um, so one time, how it happened, I don't know, but his car wound up on the front lawn of the of the courthouse. <laughs> and so, I don't know what, I think he got the Distinguished Driving Award or something like that. But anyway, how has it changed? It seems to me everything was more collegial, more fun, uh, but that just may be my imagination. Although I think others would agree with that. If you had others my age, would agree with that, I think. <clears throat> you mentioned a couple uh, uh, of gentlemen. I was wondering who were some of your role models, particularly lawyer role <laughs> models, in the beginning of your career as you were building uh, well, your Well, one was Arthur W. Egan, who was a very adept uh, trial lawyer, usually trying injury cases, personal injury cases, uh, and usually on the defense side. This was back when I, I was with the law firm of, uh, well, let's see, it was then called uh, Hancock, Ryan, 
uh, show in Houston or something like that. But um, uh, the um, firm represented a lot of insurance companies, so they were doing mainly defense work in uh, negligence cases, personal injury cases, and things like that. And this is, was Art Egan's fort. He was excellent. He just had a certain way with the, with the jury, a charm, a sort of a, uh, well, he was short, kind of roly-poly, roly But nice looking guy who uh, he sort of was, had a farm, a farmer's uh, way about him, and very easy. And the, the jury just loved him. I mean, he just had a wonderful uh, way with jurors, particularly jurors in uh, uh, outlying counties, more rural counties. So he was certainly, and then Mr. Ryan, Lewis C. Ryan, <coughs> was another great trial lawyer. And uh, see, he had a very high position in the um, American Bar Association. I can't quite remember what it was, but it was, he was a different kind of trial lawyer. Sort of a, uh, oh, a more, uh, or kind of louder, Honed, uh, but very uh, articulate, very smart. So those were two in in the office who were role models for me at that time. <coughs> it's interesting that you picked uh, that you chose one who uh, had a tr tremendous amount of charisma, in your opinion, and another who was uh, somewhat authoritative. Yeah, he had, you'd have to say he had, he was charismatic too, because any good trial lawyer has to relate to, to the uh, jury, there's no question about it. You have to come across in whatever way seems natural for you. Everybody approaches the convincing the jury differently and so my, my approach would not be like either of those. I guess if I would say that my approach might be that, that uh, the jury thought that I was coming across naturally and that I was sincere and uh, making a sincere and effective and articulate argument on my side of the case and that seemed to work for me but um, everybody's different and uh, some some lawyers were louder and more bombastic and that was never my style <clears throat> so anyway you, had you a lot of fun doing that you you were actually a, a, a very noted trial lawyer. Uh, I'm not sure that that's really true. I, I, uh, I tried all sorts of different kind of uh, well, cases, uh, and, uh, but I, because you see, I, I'm 10 years of entering the office, Hancock, uh, I sort of started what I call my my uh, uh, political career, which is sort of like a, uh, let's say, a, a uh, meteor, meteoric political career, like a meteor in that sort of a, a very bright uh, light and then all goes dark. So, but I had a wonderful time and so my meteoric political career really started uh, in 1961 it would be when uh, they persuaded me to run for the Board of Education of Syracuse 
and uh, I never <laughs> thought about running for the Board of Education, but uh, I've, I've always been one, and I've told my uh, classes at Syracuse University, uh, where I still teach, by the way, the law school, uh, you're going to find many, many times during your career a chance to do something and you're going to say, should I or shouldn't I do it? And, and so I've always, <laughs> always accepted the challenge uh, because if you don't do it, you're always going to wonder what it would be like if, if uh, you had done it. So I decided to do this, and really running for the Board of Education in those days didn't amount to anything. You would go to a few teas and be nice to some elderly ladies who were there, and that's about all you had to do, and, and you were elected. So I was elected, and but during that campaign, I, I uh, became, became acquainted with William Walsh, who was running for mayor at that time, and we became good friends, and so he asked me to become his corporation council, the first full-time corporation council of the city, and so, uh, again, <laughs> I, should I or shouldn't I, and I decided, well, yes, I will do this. So that meant I, I really had to give up being on the Board of Education. And uh, so I became Corporation Council <coughs> of the city. And um, the first full-time Corporation Council, I got Les Deming from Mount Shenkin King to come in as my first assistant. And Bill Roy uh, was a trial lawyer, later became Judge William Roy, trial lawyer at the McKenzie office, came in as my trial lawyer, and we set up a uh, really a little law firm. And uh, so we had an absolutely fascinating time, great stories I can't go into now, but I was corporation counsel for two years. <clears throat> and then, uh, do you want me to continue with this? Yeah, I, actually I do. I, I, I'd like to hear a little bit about that time as you were a corporation well, counsel. Maybe uh, tell us one of those well, stories. Well, um, <laughs> one, there were two investigations. One of the police department, in which wound up uh, with the, the chief of police, Harold Kelly, having to retire, and I don't know what. I don't think any action was taken against him. And, and they came in and, um, uh, oh, they uh, reported uh, violations of this and that, uh, very picky own things, such as the policeman accepting a bottle of whiskey at Christmas time from the, from the um, owners of the store on the corner or something. And so, one of the uh, things that they had investigated had to do with with uh, the commissioner of of uh, taxes, uh, tax commissioner Ben Gingold, who had always been our hearing officer for little. Uh, disputes, little uh, charges against police officers or somebody like that. And um, so um, I'm perhaps telling stories out of school here, but I'll go ahead anyway. We can always talk with Ben and say, Ben, you know, we really don't think this amounts to much of anything. And he said, I understand. And so we put the proof in. and. Uh, that was the way it was done. Well, now Ben had appeared in the big headline, uh, being investigated for something. I can't remember what it was. It never amounted to anything thereafter, but we couldn't really use him now. And so then we decided, well, we, 
we uh, really can't get a Republican. We'll have to find a Democrat as someone to act in Ben's place. Uh, we got Dean Curris from the law school, uh, a Democrat, and no one could say that anything that happened thereafter was political or anything like that. So then, uh, Bill Roy, who was putting in some proof having to do with some of these little minuscule, unimportant charges against these people. Uh, and uh, Les and I had a, we had to have a uh, little discussion as to whether Bill thought he could talk <laughs> with Dean Curtis off the record. <laughs> and we said, oh, well, go ahead, try it. And it turned out he was completely understanding of what we were trying to do. And so with the, with the bottle of whiskey kind of charge, he'd give him a little um, lecture or something like that and dismiss the charge. And so everything worked out fine. So that was just one of the many, many stories. Another, another uh, episode had I think it was a later investigation had had to do with uh, some uh, corruption up on the north side, and uh, it's a uh, I wrote a song <clears throat> which I whenever I call up Les Deming now I I start I sing the song and the song goes like this. <clears throat> Um, I call him Cosmo. He, he calls me John. You'll see why. <clears throat> and the song goes like this. Oh, Cosmo and John Mandarino <clears throat> ran a big gambling casino up on the north side. Things were opened up wide with a payoff to Sergeant Sardino. And uh, that was... <laughs> he wouldn't have dared sing that at that time, believe me. But uh, so he had lots of, lots of things like that. And uh, then um, after two years uh, as corporation counsel, and then <clears throat> I, I got a call from Mr. Collum and Senator Hughes John, Senator John Hughes then was the big, very, very powerful senator in the New York State Republican and sort of the Republican leader, of not only of Onondaga County, but upstate too, I would say. Very able, very, very able guy. And uh, he had had to take over as Republican County Chairman during the uh, uh, Kennedy-Nixon uh, campaign of 1960, uh, because we'd had a scandal of some of some kind with George Traster. I don't know. He had to resign, and right in the middle of the <coughs> of the uh, election campaign, so John Hughes stepped in and took his place. And uh, now it is uh, four years later, or a few years later or so, and he's still doing it, and he has all his other responsibilities. So uh, they called me over, Mr. Collum and uh, John Hughes called me over, and uh, Mr. Collum, and I call him Uncle Thad, he sort of put his arm around me and said, Stuart, my boy, John and I have been talking <clears throat> John's exhausted, and uh, he can't keep doing this uh, uh, anymore. He has to find somebody to take his place as Republican County Chairman, and we've been talking, we think you uh, to do this. Well, I said, but I don't know anything about being Republican County Chairman, and I'm sort of making this up as you don't worry, you don't have to know, you don't have to know anything. Uh, you'll be able to do it. Don't worry. So I said, well, let me 
think about it, and so I did, and finally got back to them and, uh, and said, uh, well, okay, I'll do it. And again, the same thing, but do you do it or don't you do it? I've always done it, <laughs> just to see, see what would, what would happen. <laughs> Sounded like a new experience, and why not? And so I'll do it, but Ruthie and I have to go skiing for a week. And so we went up to Mont Tremblant and uh, skied for a week, came back. <laughs> so I called up Agnes Cook, the um, uh, secretary who knew everything, you know. I mean, she had been secretary of the Republican Party for years and knew everything about everything. So I called Agnes to see, to say, Agnes, I'm back, and anything happened. And she said, well, now, you better sit down <laughs> before I tell you. Uh, I said, oh my God, what? <laughs> so she said, well, you're gonna see it. The morning paper, there'll be two inch headlines saying that Assemblyman Hatch, Republican Assemblyman from the northern part of the county, has disappeared. <laughs> and John Hughes and Larry Willison and the other senator, they put out a, a missing person alarm for him, 50 state alarm. Well, uh, it turned out that Assemblyman Hatch, uh, he, he surfaced in Las Vegas. <laughs> Where he'd had the bad judgment of passing a $5,000 check without any funds. <laughs> so that was my first problem. <laughs> and the, at the end of uh, two years, uh, oh, well, I guess <laughs> the main thing is this is January 1964, and uh, the presidential election is LBJ versus. Barry Goldwater, who went to the to the uh, Republican convention in in uh, San Francisco and that summer. Barry Goldwater was nominated, and of course the Republican Party was totally split. And uh, and so for the ever since the um, founding of the Republican Party in 1856, Onondaga County had gone overwhelmingly for the Republican presidential candidate. Uh, even in 1932, when Alf Landon ran against uh, FDR and succeeded in getting eight electoral votes against FDR's getting all the rest, uh, Onondaga County crashed through with two-thirds of the voters voting for Alfred E. Landon. That is the way it was until my first year as Republican County Chairman. <laughs> we, we were absolutely swamped. Lost everything. Lost judicial seats, lost assembly seats, and oh my God, what? And so, um, I started, um, oh, yes, at the end of that, the end of my, am I going too long on this? No, no. All right. Uh, well, after surviving that, which was hard to do, uh, I thought, that I detected a groundswell for me to run, uh, to regain the congressional seat 
which had been lost in the 1964 uh, landslide election. And uh, <coughs> what happens often with potential candidates or aspiring candidates, whatever, what they may perceive to be groundswells uh, turn out only to be ripples. And so it was in my case. <laughs> I did, I did run, but uh, lost handily to Jim Hanley, who had won uh, in nineteen uh, in in the nineteen sixty four election and ran, trying to get the seat back in nineteen sixty six. Several candidates thereafter tried to beat Jim, but none succeeded. He ultimately retired, and he did a good job as uh, our congressman. So that was the end of my political career, which is the greatest thing that could have happened to me because we had six small children at the time, and I wouldn't have been a good, a, a, a good uh, congressional politician, and uh, that was really not my my calling. So then I uh, went back to practicing law and uh, trying cases, arguing appeals, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> and then in uh, 1971, uh, the then Republican chairman, I think it was, might have been Marty Hour, I'm not sure, anyway, called and said, you know, uh, uh, Judge Vanette had died. Uh, Supreme Court Justice, and so there's a vacancy, and um, I've been talking with many people, and we um, we want to submit your name to the to the um, governor, Governor Nelson Rockefeller, to appoint you in his place. And I said I I never thought about being a judge, and uh, uh, and really. This was something completely out of the blue, as far as I was concerned, and wasn't sure that it was anything that I was interested in. <laughs> but then, <laughs> uh, I sort of came around to thinking, well, all right. Oh, I sort of found, uh, I sort of checked to see if I did this as a Supreme Court Justice, uh, whether I might go to the appellate division uh, and make a career as, a, as an appellate judge. And so you're never guaranteed about that, but I thought after checking it that chances look pretty good that that might develop. So I did it and uh, loved it and it turned out to be exactly the right thing for me to do. Before we get into the um, into your years as a uh, uh, Supreme Court justice and appellate court judge, I was wondering if you could um, perhaps tell us a little bit uh, about uh, perhaps some of the most challenging uh, times as a uh, as a trial attorney. So, so going back a little bit and tell us about uh, some of those chi challenging <coughs> moments. Well, I, uh, I've had a lot of, uh, I, I can remember one of the cases I've lost, I remember one in federal court having to do with, <coughs> with uh, taxes and uh, can't remember the exact details of that, but, um, and yeah, I can remember um, cases, um, you know, accident-type cases where the jury hasn't agreed with me and so on, but nothing really stands out. Well, I think one of the most difficult cases um, that um, I had was after I <coughs> got off the bench, and uh, 
this was representing the New York State Senate in a lawsuit uh, brought by the governor against the Senate, Governor Pataki against the Senate and the Assembly. And uh, so this had to do with the power of the governor in the budget uh, being his power to <coughs> revise the budget which is submitted by the by the legislature. So it had very important aspects of interpreting the, the state constitution. <clears throat> and, uh, and so I represented the Senate and another uh, uh, law firm from New York represented the Assembly and it was a very hotly contested thing. And Judge K, it was a split decision Judge Kay wrote a very, very, very sound uh, dissent. And uh, so that was one of the more challenging pieces of litigation that I've done. But some of the most challenging ones are some cases which I've been doing recently. Go into those now, unless you want me to. Uh, um Actually, yeah, let's, uh, while you're on the topic, let's, uh, I'd like to know what you've been doing lately and, uh, uh. <clears throat> Well, I, after, uh, I retired from the Court of Appeals, <clears throat> and I say facetiously that I retired under a rule known as the rule of statutory senility, which sets in by statute on the uh, 31st day of December of the year in which the judge, he or she, turns 70. It happens to be New Year's Eve. And uh, at the stroke of midnight, the last stroke <laughs> of midnight, the judge, he or she, perhaps having consumed a martini or two, who knows. But anyway, on that last stroke, that judge was by statute senile, which means that <laughs> the judge, that ex-judge can no longer be a judge, but that does not stop the judge from going back and being a lawyer again. Right. And so that's what I've done, and that was, mm, Eighteen, eighteen, almost nineteen years ago. So I've been practicing law for nineteen years since I got off, <laughs> since I left the court. And uh, and you've had some of your more challenging cases since yeah, then. Yeah, I have. <clears throat> I did a lot of arbitration. <clears throat> Not doing so much of that anymore. Although I'd like to do, I'd like to do more. My. Uh, arbitration and mediation and with this new uh, partnership that I'm of counsel to, that's uh, Goris and, and O'Sullivan, we hope to do some local kind of arbitration and mediation. But the sort that I was doing uh, is with big international heavy kind of arbitration and uh, had some really interesting cases. One of the more interesting ones uh, I'll tell you about, if you wish. Uh, and that had to do <coughs> with uh, a um, satellite which um, is sent up to, um, to really relay Relay um, Sign visible signals and so on down to those people who who get TV with the discs and uh, and so this is a commercial uh, satellite company <coughs> and they sent the satellite up on a big uh, rocket in 
top of a rocket in Kazakhstan, big Russian rocket. And <coughs> so you uh, send the satellite up, but it, the solar arrays, which are for the satellite, obviously have to be tucked way in. They're, they're tucked in and held in with wire or some sort of device. Otherwise, you couldn't possibly get through the atmosphere. And uh, so then they shoot the satellite up, and when it gets up to its orbit, which is beyond the atmosphere, uh, then you send an electronic signal up, and these uh, solar arrays are supposed to deploy like that, and then you have the uh, photoelectric cells exposed to the sun always, and that's your source of energy for the satellite. Well, they sent this satellite up and sent the signal up to have the solar arrays deploy and only one deployed it on, and that was only partially and the other one didn't deploy at all. So now you've got the satellite up there cost millions of dollars to uh, produce the satellite and then get it launched and put it up. And you have to, at the time, but to do that, you have to reserve a certain space. Uh, and this was going up to a very, very high expense space, which is over the eastern seaboard of the United States. It's a premium space. You have to reserve that. And that's what this satellite was supposed to serve. So it was an enormous expense. And so the defendant responded in the arbitration was the insurance carrier. And the question uh, under the, in, in the fine print of the in, insurance uh, document itself was the definition of total loss, a total loss, which would mean they'd have to pay for the whole thing, uh, is uh, determined as to whether or not the satellite has lost 50% or more of its usefulness. So that's what the whole thing was about. And uh, we had expert opinions and diagrams on how it works and every every single thing that you can imagine went on for a long time. Fortunately, I had a very uh, uh, sound, very, very good engineer. There were three, I was the chairman of the arbitration board and uh, we had uh, one co-arbitrator who had been a a uh, admiralty lawyer, very, very good, sound guy, and then the other arbitrator who had uh, had a career working for, I think, GE. He was an engineer, and he knew he could explain all of the technical stuff <laughs> and explain the uh, technical testimony of the experts. And so, yeah, that was, that was a fascinating case uh, for me, and we finally did determine um, that uh, indeed it had lost 50% of its um, value. But then the question is, okay, but less salvage. Okay, what salvage value does a partially disabled <laughs> a satellite half, which is up there. And so anyway, we uh, decided, all right, we'll, we'll uh, recommend in our award to uh, a, uh, a mediator, a mediator to see if they can't mediate the question of salvage value. And they did, and I don't know what they arrived at, but they that was the end of the case, but um, 
Oh, and then, oddly enough, oddly enough, we learned later that um, the, the particular uh, array which hadn't deployed suddenly decided to deploy. <laughs> This was two, two or three years later. So anyway, that was that was an interesting case, and and uh, so I've had oh, and then another sort of thing that I I've, I've done is act as uh, expert witness on questions of New York law uh, in arbitrations pending in. Uh, foreign countries uh, or litigations in foreign countries because <coughs> many many of the even those which don't have anything to do with the United States many many contracts uh, uh, refer to New York law as the the law which will govern some dispute as to what a particular contract means, and so did a lot of of um, acting as expert witness in uh, cases involving interpretation of contracts and and application of New York law. Oh, in London or in uh, Paris, a couple of times, and in. in um, the Hague a couple of times and so on. So, but I don't, uh, I, don't I haven't done any of that recently. And uh, so what am I doing now? And well, we want to get into, as I told you, doing some lower key, smaller case arbitration and mediation, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> but I've been doing a lot of work uh, for Hiscock Legal Aid Society uh, in representing their um, defendants in criminal cases on appeals. I, I take appeals. You, you've done uh, I've done a lot of, of, of work, yeah, uh, particularly uh, for um, uh, organizations. On, on, uh, on, on behalf of Long. Can you go into a little bit about uh, about your uh, well, your care. work with Hiscock and volunteer work that you've done in that? Uh, <clears throat> As we speak, I'm, I'm waiting for a decision. <clears throat> and uh, two of them are uh, pro bono cases for Hiscock Legal Aid. And one of them is uh, maybe decided today or maybe decided on Thursday. People against uh, Ingram, which I argued in the Court of Appeals. All decision, I got leave in the Court of Appeals uh, to, uh, to uh, appeal it up there. And I argued the case up there, and we'll see what happens. This has to do <coughs> with a new statute, uh, you know, it's, uh, I don't know, two eleven point ten or something like that of the penal law, <clears throat> which makes it a a crime, makes it a um, uh, a misdemeanor for it's a person who is lawfully being interrogated, somebody who is under arrest or lawfully in custody or detained. You have to be under arrest or lawfully in custody and detained uh, after being warned, pursuant to the statute, to get a um, wrongful identification a reply to an identification question such as, what is your name? Uh, when were you born, where do you live, things of that kind. If the police warn before asking the question and it turns out that the suspect has given a uh, 
wrongful answer, then they can uh, arrest the sub suspect for having committed a crime right then and there. And so that's what this case is about. And uh, it involves <coughs> uh, the, what I think is the misuse of this particular statute to arrest somebody when there's no reason for detaining him, no reason for, uh, he's not under arrest. I suspect that uh, he might have had drugs. You know about that. And so they, they, want, they want an opportunity to arrest him. And then, of course, if you arrest somebody, then you can all do the arrest. So that's what the case is about, very. And it's going to be interesting to see how the Court of Appeals deals with it because if they, I won't go into the circumstances of this case, but if they do say that um, this, what happened here was okay, then that opens the door for using this particular statute for purposes for which it was never intended. It was passed. The legislative history will tell you it was passed uh, because uh, uh, prior to its passage, it was perfectly legal for a, a suspect being interrogated to, to lie about his name or age or where he was from and so on and so forth. Perfectly legal. And sometimes they would as a result of lying, they'd get away, and then the police would find out, hey, <laughs> this information was entirely wrong, and they got us in. Now they'd have to go and try to find him again. So that's what this is for, for setting up, not to be used to create a means to arrest somebody so you can search him when there's no other, no real reason for arresting him. So that's one of them, and, that's, and then I argued one in the appellate division, <coughs> briefly about that. All right, I call this a bad day, <coughs> and the defendant in this case, Holt. <coughs>